Hello and welcome to the Leading Minds podcast. This is episode 12. Now, we apologise for the absence. We've had a few personnel changes over the past few weeks and I've lo- a, a few things happening in the background, hence why me and Shazad have been a bit quiet. But past that now, it is Black History Month, so every single one of our guests this month is going to be an incredible black man or black woman. And today, I am really, really excited. I've been looking forward to this one. I don't know how I've landed him, because in my eyes, he's a superstar. Ah. But we have the incredible Aaron Roach Bridgman he's, on the podcast. Over there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me, bro. Thank you for that undeserving intro. But um, I appreciate it. Man. Nah, don't don't be so <laughs> humble, man. Honestly, I, I'm, I'm really excited. So um, the topic for, for, for this month, guys, is um, inequality and... <clears throat> with it being Black History Month, we are going to focus on an unequal world and, and what it is to be be treated unequally um, as a black man or as a as a black woman or as a as a person of colour, should I say. Um I want I don't want to introduce Aaron and, and, and say what he does because it's gonna sound a lot better from coming from him. So Aaron, talk to the people. Who are you? What do you do? Uh so my name's Aaron Roach Bridgman. Um I'm a TV presenter documentary maker slash presenter um i'm also a behavior specialist so i specialize in dealing with challenging behavior in young adults and um yeah i'm also a poet um so i do spoken word poetry also written poetry um in fact poetry is what kind of got me into the industry slightly but um i feel like i've been sleeping on that passion and i always say to people don't sleep on your passions but i'll make my way back into into creating poetry as well but at the moment i've just been really focused on um on presenting in fact i'm even a vlogger now so i've started a role recently where i'm a vlogger now as well so i vlog um for a company all around the country um so yeah just a, a creative i guess i'm a creative but um yeah haven't always been that way so i'm um, interested to get into the conversation today <laughs> Do you know um what really gets me about your story is the environment that you grew up in yeah so you're from harleston yeah <clears throat> And it was pretty tough on the streets over there, right? You you, you had a choice, but you've kind of come out of that to become as prominent as you are at the moment. At what point do you think growing up on on the streets and amongst that violence that you you actually made a choice to say, I don't want to get involved in that. I want to go down this route. Um, I think, you know, if I'm really honest, there was a time where... I started to notice the cyclical nature of things and I'm like, okay, hold on, so just gone to jail. Oh, so and so's died, oh he's gone to jail, so and so's died. And I'm just like as much as there were times where you could see people shining, you know, they would make money from doing whatever street street activities they were doing, I noticed that there was a cycle and it's like even if you were shining, there'll be a time when you would go to jail and you might lose it all. Um I've seen people unfortunately pass away. My best friend has passed away. Yeah. Um and so I was like I think I need to think about an alternative method of trying to make my way in life. And I I, I always say this when I do talks, I say, there comes a time in your life when you realize your friends are going this way and you're gonna have to go that way. And that's the hardest thing that you're ever gonna have to do as a young man or a young lady making a decision Mm -hmm. is literally go an opposing way to your friends. And so I remember GCSEs came for instance. I know this is going back, but I remember GCSEs came and I remember saying to my friends, look, it's only going to be about two or three weeks. Let's just study and try and get some like, some, some results. You know what I mean? We could try and use them in our life. I, I said it in a more hood way. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can and, imagine. And yeah, and they were like, yeah, yeah, no, you're right, Roach. Yeah. Everyone calls me Roach, by the way. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, you're right, Roach. And I was like, cool. And I remember one day I was revising. I thought one of my friends, he's actually in jail right now, but he's coming out soon, hopefully. Um, I said to him, oh, you'd be right. He said, oh, I can't lie, I'm out on the street. I'm saying, bro, I said to you, let's stay off of the streets. Let's just use these couple of weeks just to revise. He didn't do it. And then I remember results that he came now. And um, I remember feeling kind of embarrassed because I had 11 GCSEs. Like, I had, like, six B's. you done really well yeah, in your education, yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> considering the background yeah. that you came from. <laughs> but, but then you say that you were embarrassed about it. I was embarrassed because when, I, when, when we went to, pe- um, to, to collect them, I remember, like, a lot of my... Well, all the friends that I was with, they, I think the highest grade, I think, was like a D. Even a few of them had U's. I didn't even know U's existed. Yeah. And so I was embarrassed. I was like, oh, man. But I was kind of angry for them as well. I was like, I told you we should just do this. And I, I went back to the hood now. Sorry, I went back to the ends, to, to where I'm from. And it was weird. Like, they started telling people, and people were kind of more kind of celebrating it. 
And I was like, this is weird. I, didn't, I wasn't expecting that. I was yeah. embarrassed because I was thinking I'm going to come across like some sort of like buffing. Yeah, yeah. Or something <laughs> like that. But actually, the the reverse happened. You know what I mean? Um, a lot of people were actually, oh, yeah, like kind of celebrate. Yeah, Roach got 11 GCSEs, you know? And I was like, oh. And that's the first time that I realized actually achievement could be championed even amongst our, yeah. our environment. So going forward, I said, what do I do? I said, maybe academics might be a little bit of an avenue. So um, I decided to beg this... Well, my, my parents decided to beg the school to take me because I got expelled. But they, they decided to beg the school to um, take me for sixth form because just based on the sheer um, results that I had um, academically, because um, my parents really felt like if I went to college, I was going to go away with, which is a possibility, but I don't know. They wanted me to go to sixth form because they felt like it would have been more conducive to the to the development of my, of my academic um, career, I guess. And so I went to sixth form. I did better on my sixth form. And then I was like, okay, what's next? I, I didn't know. I yeah. don't come from a background. You just took it, just took yeah. it as it came. I yeah? didn't know. I didn't yeah. know at university. They were like, mm -hmm. oh, you can go to university. And I was like, what's that? And they were like, you know, explaining to me. And I was like, oh. Then they explained to me, you can go to another country. And I was like, yes. Because I always wanted to go to America. Um, and so I started to look into <laughs> going to America. I got a few prospectuses. And I went to the back of the prospectus and seen it said like, 20 grand per term and I was like that is not possible but then I found out you could leave your city and I was like you know if I'm going to do this education stuff I think I need to leave my city because if I stay here very much possible I can get drawn back into into crazy stuff and so I went to the University of Birmingham and then that kind of started off me on an academic and a more kind of like career career minded um, pathway I started to really express myself academically which I had never done I'd always hold back my academic ability because I didn't see it as cool I went to Birmingham and I was like probably one of the more lesser intelligent people, which really made me feel like, yeah, let me express this intelligence, let me strive. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, so I did my university and then I came out and started pushing towards. So I would say, if I'm really honest with you, maybe about 16 or 17, when I really started to kind of like adjust the mentality, it was quite late. That's, I, I, I think that's early though. That, that is yeah. early. I mean, if you think, just take it a step back, right? Yeah. A lot of people that come from that kind of environment are very much influenced by their peers. Yeah. It seems as though you were able to detach yourself from that, but equally became kind of a figure point mm. for motivating the people around you. Yeah. Indirectly, that's, yeah. That's quite strange, yeah. Yeah. right? Because at that age, we're so malleable, we're mm. so easily influenced by our environment. Do you think that it was maybe the culture, your upbringing, kind of differentiated you away from everybody else that was being influenced by their peers yeah if i'm i don't do this enough but if i'm really honest and i hate doing this but i have to do it i really have to give credit to my parents yeah mm -hmm. they got mum and dad yeah actually. yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah like they were on to me they were really on to me I, unlike a lot of people around me my parents were on to me even with this whole curfew thing like growing up in hood no they have no curfew you know what i mean sometimes if people just take the piss oh Roche, you gotta go home i'm like yeah i gotta go home mate. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? like they, they were really on to me but i always say to even parents now especially as a behavior specialist i'm saying look, you might feel like you're speaking on deaf ears to your children but believe me those messages echo in the head yeah years later yeah, yeah. and i think with me the messages echoed in my in my mind later when i was making certain decisions with it that would have maybe made me go this way or that way because there was times in my life that i had to make some serious decisions like decisions where I could go and go along with something that was very serious. I can't really talk about it, but very serious yeah. or go this way. And I'm, I think sometimes even my dad's Bayesian accent and my mum like, they <laughs> just echoed in my head. And I was like, do you know what? Let me just try and do the best because I haven't got time to be bringing these people stress or letting them down for all of the... <laughs> For all, of, for all of what they've tried to put into me so if i'm really honest mm. parents yeah like they um their strictness kind of allowed me to have uh i guess it was more of an in, a conducive environment for me to 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 stray away from from the more negative things but you don't you don't see it at the time like i'll be honest with you even down to my career every step that i've taken it's felt like okay what should i do now and i've con and i've con I've, I've kind of consulted or conferred with people um and through those those conferred conversations i've made decisions like so even when it came to academics i didn't really have anybody around me that was going to university i had to have conversations with people that that did know when it came to my career there were people that were around me that believed more in me than i believed in myself we'll get into that more later but um i really give thanks for the people who were around me especially those who had belief in me and those who just spent some time to have a conversation with me because literally i did not know where i was going i took every step as it came from a levels to degree choice even when it came to the degree i changed my degree in the end because 
I was doing a course that was more kind of like trying to appease my dad. He didn't believe in me going into the creative industry. He didn't believe that you need to study drama. Or, but that's a cultural thing, yeah, right? That's a cultural like, thing. Yes, yeah. like we. I always say to people, yeah, like African, Caribbean, Asian parents, they don't believe in dreams. And yeah. I, don't, I don't mean yeah. to say this in a yeah. disparaging manner, yeah, yeah but mm. they don't believe in dreams because because they believe in trades. Yeah, mm. they believe in you studying for a for a for a for a for a, for a, a malleable some a trade <coughs> that you know something that you can actually use and go out there. And it's a money security off. thing. Yes, exactly. It, it's I, a security. I think it's security. Thing. It's cultural, yeah. and if they are not creative if they don't have those dreams and those yeah. aspirations it's alien to them you know um whether it be singing acting dancing how many how many um incredible actors out there now were probably told by their um parents or their friends oh don't do that you know you need you need to go to university you need to do this and it's that it's those com it's those normal conforming stepping stones mm -hmm. and and we see it every day so it kind of tells us like I, may, maybe you are right mm -hmm. and and one thing I find interesting, like I, w I want to kind of flip what you said because okay. <coughs> you say that your parents were strict, but I'm saying I was like, it sounds like they were so supportive of you in in certain ways. I mean, and listen, of course they were strict, you know, <laughs> they're giving you curfews and stuff like that. But um, the, the the fact that they 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 did these things, like you said, it's it's echoing years later for you now, yeah. and I think I think it's it's kind of why. You are the man you are today, yeah. in a way. Do you know you're right? I think years later you realize what parents were doing. At the time, they feel like an enemy. I like, like an enemy. Yeah. I remember being in a meeting with a teacher, and I'm, my mum would literally shift her chair to side with the teacher. And I'm like, Yo, what the hell are you doing? You're a pagan. But now, as someone who became a behavior a behavior specialist yeah. who deals with challenging behavior in young adults, I knew exactly what she was doing. She had to show a united front that we were going to try and help deal with the behavior that I was displaying. And she couldn't go against them because then that's, mm. what's that going to do? That's, yeah. that, that's yeah. Do you know what? I think we forget what our parents went through. Yeah. Um, if you're first generation, second generation, 100%. right? When they came to this country, <clears throat> they didn't have a sense of security. Mm. They've been put into mm. a position of, I mean, we majority of our, of our forefathers or our relatives have come here as economic migrants. Yeah. Yeah. So you've come here to get a better life. But where do you get a better life from in your mind, yeah. from the outside looking into this country, is from having a nine to five, looking around you, thinking, okay, I'm a blue collar worker, which mm -hmm. would have been predominantly what they were. Mm -hmm. um, and then looking at the white collar workers and, and, and people in higher professions saying, do you know what? That's security. Why? Because they earn more money and they have the respect in society. Yeah. Yeah. So for our parents to be strict yeah. and to try and instill those uh, behaviours into us, mm -hmm. we're trying to adapt. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how it was for you, but you're trying to find a middle ground yeah. of trying to be accepted yeah. in society, but equally being pushed by your parents yeah. to accept something culturally different. Yeah. And this is a conversation that I have with my friend because he um he sometimes gets onto his parents saying that they didn't make the right decisions, they should have owned a property, they should have done more, they should have done this. And I'm saying, bro, you need to understand that these guys that were born in the 50s and the 60s, sometimes even the 40s, um, it's a completely different life that they yeah. were living. Mm -hmm. Like access to things were completely different. Even in the, in the documentary that I did right now, um, that's out right now, there's a conversation about access to information. Yeah. Like some people didn't make decisions based on ignorance. They made it based on the fact that they didn't have access to information. So for us to, to really go at our parents um, because maybe they could have done more is, I think on our behalf, it's, it's very, um, it's very, I think it's very hypocritical and it's also very like unkind. Mm. You know well, I mean? Something you brought up in one of your, in your, in your latest documentary yeah. is even until the 1960s, 1970s at a push, Youngest. people couldn't access yeah. resources if you yeah. were a person of color. Exactly. Now, that's insane. Yeah. I mean, we're only yeah. talking about 50, 50 yeah. odd years ago, right? It's, but it's always been the way that, um, it's always been the way, because you need to understand that societies were built on the structure of trying to keep the rich rich. And um, unfortunately the way that, that that was done, especially um, I guess uh, historically, has been through, you know, information and understanding. Yeah. Like, I hate to bring this into the conversation as well, but even when you go back to like, you know, colonial times, the way that they would, um, they would keep the, you know, this, the, the indentured slaves or whatever you want to call them, um, keep them from being able to mobilize was by 
literally banning them from being able to read and yeah. write. Yeah. So it shows you just how important mm. reading and the access to yeah. information is. And I think that's happened <laughs> As, as we as we said like 50 years ago it's still it's still quite current and it's still even happening now it is happening yeah. now because it, i discovered that in on my journey it's yeah. like a reason why a lot of businesses are, are, are maybe not getting um you know the access to to funding to um to 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 money that they need to, to um to expand their businesses because sometimes they're not as financially literate as they need to be you, you know you uh, I, again this is your documentary yeah. that's out on bbc3 BBC yeah. BBC at the moment um which is it's it's amazing it's it's so good the only thing that I, I I found slightly I was slightly critical of in yeah. in that was yes there people of ethnic backgrounds are financially illiterate yeah. but I think that that completely puts a cloak over the actual issue which is financial institutions work on risk mm -hmm. they see per people of color as a higher risk mm -hmm. I don't think it's got I th I think there's a there's an element of, of kind of financial miseducation or whatever yeah. but. I think that people of color are looked at as a higher risk to default. 100%. And that's got mm -hmm. nothing to do with financial literacy. No, that's true. 100% true. And I think the only way that we that that's combated is through uh, more people showing that success. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, when you look at people of color, if you look at the Asian community, I don't think they're viewed as higher risk anymore. No. Because you've seen a, a massive growth of successful business. Yeah. And so when it comes to an Asian person to come in for maybe for a certain type of collateral or whatever it might be or, 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 or what they call it, venture capital, yeah. um, it's, a, it's a different conversation. But I think, you know, even if I think personally about the amount of like local black businesses and stuff that I know, and it used to hurt me when I see things close down, you know, these are the things that they, unfortunately, the world is based on statistics and numbers. It's like, all right, let's look at what's happened. Okay, well, yeah. this has happened, so we're going to do this. It's hard for people to, to, um, to change that, but like I had the company on my on, on the documentary Lendo, they're doing a lot to try and help businesses get into a into a fit shape where that when they go and try to access this type of capital, it could be more of a of a possibility. But um yeah, but going back to what I was saying, it's the same thing with our parents. Like we have to really understand what they went through and also as you're saying, like they would have gone through some of this um some of this literal, you know, leave them about the information, let them try and, and they, they didn't know what they were doing. Yeah. Like for instance, my parents, I should even talk about this is personal, but my parents bought their house in something called a shared ownership. At the time, shared ownership seemed like it made sense because it was a way for you to access um, home owning. And also for them, they wanted to move out of the hood, so yeah. which, which they did a lot faster than maybe they would have been able to. But ultimately shared ownership means that you pay rent and you pay mortgage. The rent can be put up at any time. So in the end, you, you you end up paying more than what you would pay for a mortgage anyway. But do I judge them? No, not completely, because I understand that people did what they did at a time to allow, yeah. to allow themselves to mobilize. And to be honest, they probably did it because of me. They knew what, what, what I was like mentally. They knew that I was a hothead. They knew that I'm not one to back down. They knew that I'm one to have to, you know, I mean, I'm not going to get into it. But <laughs> so they, they knew what I was yeah. like. So maybe the decision that they made was was in reference to their son, who they worried about. So how can I judge them? I can't, I have to understand. And yeah, and that's the conversation that I have regularly. Mm. So, so let's come back uh, to that a little bit because you touched on earlier that you internalized things at yeah. that point. Now you're a, a poet yeah, and some of your poetry, I've, I've read it, yeah. it's amazing. Thank you. Right? Um, yeah. There's an early poem that you did in and around black history. Yeah. If you were internalizing, internalizing things, do you think the poetry was your way of expressing oh, 100%. your you, th those 100%. emotions? That's why I started writing. Yeah, I started writing because um, like I used to rap, I used to MC, and you know that was like a certain style. It was very colloquial, um, but then secretly I would write poetry. Yeah, and there was two elements to it. The first element was is that I, I got inspired by a poet called Caroline Duffy. Um, uh, she's a, a, a poet from from Scotland. She was a poet laureate, as far from me as you could possibly get. But something about her writing. I just loved it, bro. I loved her style of writing. I loved the descriptiveness. And I was like, you know, but I think I could do this as well. So the first thing was I thought, you know, I want to show that you can be from where I'm from and you can write um, in a high English um, style, just like anybody else who would be seen as a literary contemporary. Second thing is that there was things that I was experiencing, feeling and going through that I didn't, I wasn't really, and even to now, I'm not really good at expressing my emotions, yeah. like my, my deepest, like, I guess, hurting or hurtful emotions. But I was like, I can disguise it in allegory i can describe I, I can describe i can i can i can hide it and disguise it in in metaphor 
I can hide and disguise it in um in in all these linguistic techniques that poetry allows and I found it so relieving so refreshing and also a way for me to get it off of me yeah like I've written a poem called um toilet it's not about the toilet but it's toilet personif- person it's personifying something else you know what I mean I, r- I wrote a poem called chicken uh, yeah <laughs> chicken <coop. laughs> yeah it's not about it's not about chicken at all it's about it's about how does it go it goes um uh there's a lot of um there's a lot that i need to uh, that i need to uh, th- there's a lot that i need to get off my chest um but i need you t- um what's it there's a lot i need to get off my chest oh i forget how it goes it's like my, oh like chicken breast something about but, but i need you to feel it feel it as in because and i said something like um uh but it hurts me to see my people outside just wearing one glove yeah that line it doesn't it, it sounds a bit what's he talking about when i say wearing one glove i mean it's like it's the, like so they only half. They only live in half a life. So it's like living half a life. It's half. It's half a lie. I'm um, doing what's half right. Half out of logic. Half out of spite. You know what I mean? It's like it hurts me when I see my people that have ability, that have that have talent, but they're not able to to access the full potentiality of that talent because they have to, you know, juggle. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, mm. their talent or their access, their access to opportunity is not the same. So rather be, rather than being able to to achieve that full potentiality of their of their of, of what they have as a talent, they have to juggle, as we all do. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, even just now before I came here, I said, let me jump on live. And I was speaking to Baba Tunde. Um, he's a comedian. He's actually on tour with Mo Gilligan now. But I've known Mo and I've known Baba from like years ago. And I was saying to him, one thing that I always respected about you is that you were always honest. He used to work for TFL while he was juggling being a comedian. Now he's on Gogglebox with Mo. He's supporting Mo on tour. He's got shows and stuff coming up all of it by himself. But a lot of people are not honest, honest about that juggling. And unfortunately, Unfortunately, as creatives, we all have to juggle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, like yeah. it's it's like none of us. There's been years in my life when I've been able to just literally live off of what I do as my career. But unfortunately, there's times when things go down, like you know, opportunities are not happening, um, projects get cancelled, and you have to juggle. So that's why when I, that's why I, when I say in chicken coop, you know, um, sometimes it feels like that. You know, you're you're in a chicken coop. It's a reference to society. Isn't exactly, it? Yeah. you feel like that. You know, you're living half a life half out of logic, half out of spite. You know what I mean? So, so, what, so <coughs> what you what you've just said then is, is leading on perfectly to, to kind of what I want to go into now. Yeah. So the topic with what we 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 we're, we're talking about with guests for the, this this whole month is an an unequal world and you and you've touched on a few points then and you've you've made me every time I, I speak to a guest it kinda of a light bulb goes off in my head and I think, oh my God I did, I'm, I'm look. I'm putting this into one bracket when it branches off into so many different more yeah. aspects, and you're you're making me think because <clears throat> I now I think an unequal the the topic of an unequal world can can come down to how we subconsciously how our mindsets are subconsciously from our whether it be from our nurture or nature environment what we see goes on how how we see maybe um, a white person. Um, um, in a similar situation to us but they have access to to more so i don't know how i don't know how deep and emotional you want to get but i if there's a few things that you said and uh, and it just happened with a few guests where that they hold back now listen you 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 say whatever you want to say but i want to know i want to know what goes on when no one's around (laughs) when when you're in your own head when what, what what are you thinking before you write these poems? What what are you thinking when you are when a job gets cancelled for whatever reason they've given you or, or or you're applying for a job because listen, you're a black man and the industry you're in, you are publicized. You know, you are the face of things, you know. Um I could essentially right now, for a brand new documentary that's just come out, which make sure you guys go watch it on BBC three. Um Spending Black. Yeah, spending black, the currency of community. Um even though the topic is to do with you, there could be a shitload of scrutiny that's going to come from that, from oh, from, yeah. from from various demographics of people. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I I I want I, I just want to know as dark as as deep and as dark as you want to go of 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 what goes on behind the scenes in 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 Roach's oh, yeah. head. It's a like yeah, wait, this is dark, it's a dark place. <laughs> um, but I think um, yeah. You're right. 
a lot of script for years, bro. Like all the shows. And the thing is, I go above and beyond in production meetings and being part of the production. It's funny that this is my first production credit because I've been in production of my shows for years. But telly is a funny place. They like to just give you your presenter credit because they know that actually with a producer credit, you're actually due more. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's besides the point. I, I've gone above and beyond to make sure that the narrative of the shows that I, as you say, I'm the face of, I'm happy with. Sometimes the only thing I haven't had control over is the name of the shows and some of the names of my shows I haven't really been happy with, but I've made sure that the narrative inside, even what I'm saying and even what is, because sometimes you have voiceover written, but I tend to do changes. I try to make sure that everything represents what I think is accurate and what I think is respectful and what I think represents me um, holy as well. Unfortunately, sometimes people see trailers and stuff and then they all try to take a trailer to understand the whole premise of a show, which you can't do. Even in terms of this show that just came out, there's a, a trailer where there's a white lady at the end and she's saying, you know, I don't think it's right that, you know, you should shame people into into buying. But that was part of a wider conversation. Someone saw that and got, got quite um, enraged about it. People that have saw the whole conversation are like, I agree with her wholly. Like, her, 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 her whole sentiment was... Don't, you don't need to focus on it being black oh, what, what what should be focused on is black business focusing on black culture which is a loving culture a family related culture um, a rich culture of, of, of love of, of support concentrate on the, the, the richness of black people as opposed to just calling something black owned which I think is a very valid point but sometimes people would just see a, a snippet a segment and go off Yeah. Mm. now to get back to your point um, how do you deal with, with these things well, I've had people be racist I've even, I even went to BBC Free's um, Facebook page yesterday and they had posted about the show loads of racists in there bro like just really angry about the fact that they're doing a show about well I've done a show about the currency of community I made I called I, I made that name and I did it purposely I'm a wordsmith I'm not gonna lie I I, 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 I You're a poet. yeah I recognize the power of words and this whole documentary was my idea and the whole thing was not so much to do with oh let's come and be black over here and stay to ourselves no yeah. no 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 my thing was communities. Yeah. If communities were to invest with businesses in the community, could they then become self-sustainable or self-sustaining? Why would we be having the conversation in the first instance yeah. if that support wasn't there? Exactly. This is what people don't understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, wasn't, it wasn't supposed to be separatist. That is not the thinking at all. The, the, the thinking just was, look, I've grown up seeing, especially in Harlesley, North West London, I've seen like, oh, youth centre's gone. Oh, the park is just damaged and not being fixed. Oh, that building's gone. Like, and people would always complain and say, oh, what, what are the government going to do? What are the council going to do about that? And sometimes they do nothing. But then I always think to myself, well, hold on, if we actually took these pounds that we're all making and spent it with each other, would that then allow us to have a currency of community that would then allow us to mobilise our community ourselves? That was my thinking. And that still is my thinking. And you've seen it with some communities. It's happening. Yeah. Um, so to get back to your point, so when it gets dark, I don't really, do you know what? I've got to the point now where I realize things like I, I preempt racism. I preempt mm. transgressions. Um, I preempt preconceptions. It's preemptive. So when they come now, it doesn't affect you as much. Oh yeah. As I, I yeah. like that you said as much though. Yeah, as much. Because yeah, I don't think is there's... that conditioned or is it preempted? Maybe it's conditioning. Yeah. See, this is this yeah. is this is yeah. the thing. Yeah. I was um, I was having a conversation with somebody uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about race and racism. And I said something to them, and it made. And afterwards, I thought about it, and I said, "Oh, I've only I've only experienced racism twice in my life. You, I'm really you said lucky. it to me. I said it to you. I said it to you. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, man. I forget what yeah. I said to you. Um, <laughs> um, so I said it twice. Yeah. I, I said it's happened to me twice. Aren't I lucky? Yeah. And I've been thinking about that since then. I shouldn't have experienced it at all. But, that's but it, you the just conditioning said how lucky you makes me think, oh, it's only happened yeah. twice. It could be much worse. But but this yeah. is this is what I mean, you know, like you're 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 preempting it. Like mm. you, every single whatever person of colour and, and a white person as well, you should be shocked and disgusted at whatever time you experience racism because this shit should not be happening. Yeah. That's it. It's well, do you know what? It's funny because I, it really got me thinking. Uh, I remember the first time I, I experienced racism. I think I was about seven years old. Wow. And me and my dad were walking home from school. He was walking home from school. And a, a car load of guy, a, a, a car full of guys went by, window down, and just, you know, shouted out the window, Are you fucking packies? And I, I tried to think about, like, since we had that conversation, how did I feel? 
I didn't feel fear. I felt confused. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And I think we're conditioned not necessarily to feel fear from racism, but confusion mm -hmm. because we're trying to integrate. Yeah. And again, third generation, probably fourth generation at some points now, we're still trying to integrate. It's crazy. You're, you're making documentaries about <laughs> societal issues that still exist. Yeah. Mm. You know, it's very, very difficult yeah. to try and actually say there isn't a problem. There yeah. is a problem. But it's like, it's like, it's like, um, I, don't, I don't know if any of you have seen that meme, meme, you know, and it's like, um, and it's just describing a white person saying, get the immigrants out. Yeah, yeah, but they're eating a Chinese or a curry. They drive a German car. They're wearing yeah, Italian clothes. This, there's the there's hardly any quintessential <laughs> British culture. You ask Tea and person, scones? What, what, is, what is British? They'll tell you fish and chips. That's not from Britain. Mm. And even That's that word Greece. indigenous. Yeah. You can't really use There's that nothing, in this no, country. Because everybody mm. in this country is migrants. Yeah. Or at least mixed yeah. in some way. And I think that's something like, even down to St. George. St. George was a brown man from Gibraltar. They don't like to talk about that bit. But the flag is flown. Well, it's like St. George's days. You know, Jesus. The, Jesus, yeah. Jesus is a white man. No, but, but, I mean, but, I'm, but, I'm, but I'm But I'm, but I'm talking about British. Like, there's, there's mm, hardly yeah. any things that are tea. It's not, it's from China, India. You know, like it's yeah, but Aaron, you know where that you, this this all comes from a colonial colonialism. Mindset. Of, co of course, but what? But I only I only draw attention to it to make us see just the value yeah. of of integration, the value of a heterogeneous society. Yeah, you know, it, there's a value in it. Yeah, and to get back to what you to what you were asking me about when it comes to how I feel, I think my work with behavior and my analyzing of psychology has got me too deep into understanding how people work for me to be affected by it. Now I say that to say this, through doing all of these documentaries, I've had to understand when I'm speaking to someone who's lost their child, who's been stabbed 70 times, I've got to know how to, I've got to understand the psychology of this person to know how to speak to them without triggering them but at the same time also gain information about what's happened and at the same time also be supportive. It's a very, yeah. think about that, it's yeah, a very yeah. very hard psychological um, place to be, especially as an interviewer, you know what I mean? And also you've got to think about how you're coming across on camera. There's a lot of dynamics with it. Now, to go deeper, I'm a behavior specialist, so I have to, I have to understand about challenging behavior. So, push it even further. I watch a lot of shows like Big Brother and, uh, you know the reality shows where they get put into one place. And some people always think to myself, why are you always watching this trash TV? But I came to understand the reason I watch these shows so much is because I find human interaction yeah. very interesting. It doesn't matter who you put together, there's always going to be cliquish behavior. Yeah. People are gonna to start to become separatists. And I say that to say this, as humans, we are naturally separatists. Yes, yeah. We, are, we all have an almost, uh, I don't wanna use the word innate, but almost innate prejudice. Yeah. So if all of us in this world were all the same color, what you will start to notice is we'll start to divide ourselves and separate ourselves maybe based on height. Yeah. If we were all the same height, then maybe it might become eye color. Mm. For some reason, humans always find themselves separating into click, clickish behavior, separatist behavior. And I'm not saying that to justify racism. I'm just, trying, I'm just saying it to make you understand that I've understood this because you're I've seen 100% right. Like right. I've, I've done work in primary right. schools. The yeah. kids are all with each other. Yeah. Mm. Why black? You know, no one doesn't care. But, but then, do, do then you go to high schools, and then you start to see blacks are with the blacks. Yeah, so, yeah. so that's a great Absolutely. point. Yeah. Now, because you've already highlighted that at, from a certain age with a certain mindset, we don't do it. So what changes? Why then do we start to do that? What behaviors have we learned? What have we seen for us to think they've done nothing wrong to me? But I'm going to hang around with these guys. Mm. They've done nothing wrong with me, but there's certain things about their culture that they do like that I don't like or it's outside you know? it's outside informations we all ha we all know preconceptions about each other yeah. but do we know if they're true yeah that's right we just <coughs> have heard these preconceptions mm. oh white people can't dance I know some great I know white bad white people can't dance <laughs> <laughs> I know, white white <laughs> I know black people that can't dance you know that's, that's criminal dance. you know what I mean you might hear all types of things oh Asian people smell a certain way this guy smells amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell him that. <laughs> I understand. Like these preconceptions are things that are informed to us without much valid substance. But unfortunately, we take in these things. You, you, you see it sometimes. Oh, I don't like something. Why do you like them? I just don't like them. Mm. Why? 
they can't explain to you or verbalize why they don't like this person or that or those types of people it's just just that condition i mean there's two things that you've touched on here number one is the innate our, our innate um functionality as humans to to have some kind of prejudice and if we look back at history i think and this is not a justification for racism but i think that comes from the fact that we used to live in tribes yeah. Mm. So regardless of the fact that, you know, whether you were of a different color, it wasn't necessarily that. It was the fact that this is our tribe and the tribe down the road aren't as good as us. Yeah. And if we see them, yeah. then we're going to we're going to fight them. And that, that's it was the all what it is sometimes. territorial. Mm. Sometimes it's not even just racism. It's just sometimes it's just like. I'm proud of mine. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, We're better yeah. than yeah. yours. That's yeah. right. That's right. <laughs> and then, then the other issue then is the programming and conditioning that we have. I remember, I remember about twenty odd years ago reading this article about, um, and, and I and I know it wasn't the case. I know it wasn't the case, but it was being pushed out. And there was this conversation about why are there not more black models in front on the front of magazines? And somebody actually turned around, this, this woman, uh, white woman turned around and she said, well, if we put black people on the front of magazines, our sales drop 30%. 100%. That's actually not factual. That mm -hmm. isn't. It isn't factual. But what they tried to do... Oh, she just, she just drew that out of the... She just, drew she just pulled it out of the air, man. Oh, it wow. wasn't factual. Because at the end of the day, what they tried to do is create this, Narrative. again, stereotypical white mm -hmm. family, you know, two kids, one boy, one girl, mother, father, good looking, sitting there, middle class. That's what England is. Yeah, that's perfect. Do you know that's what... That's the, you know... Now you, that, that's a great point. But do you know what I've noticed over the past few years? And it also makes me think like, oh, don't go too mad with it because I don't don't want to create more friction. So many adverts now are mixed families. Yeah. Now, I, I in one part of my mind, I'm thinking this is brilliant. But in the other mind, I'm like, don't go too mad with it because then you are going to push the they've narrative gone, to white they, people. They've already gone too mad with it. But, but, like, but they, there you go. They, they took this whole torrid time that we've had of racist and racial dynamics that have really, I guess, proliferated in a in a horrible way across the world. And they've gone all the way. And this is what I had this conversation the other day on the podcast. And I said, look, like, I'm all down for meritocracy. I like opportunity and success to be gained based on merit. Yeah. And I say that because I don't believe in black tokenism. Yeah. Yeah. But I do believe that we should have more ethnic nepotism. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because everyone else does it. But to get back to the point, what I'm trying to say is, is that I understand that as ethnic minorities in this country, well, black and, you know, what do they call it, Bane, we, um, <laughs> we I think it's, it's about five to six percent of the country we make up here. So I understand that if we're going to do it representatively, there will be less of us on programs or on shows or mm -hmm. on adverts representatively because they're, they're putting these out to the whole country. And I guess people have to see what they look like. But at the same time, there should at least be you know, a few of us now and again. But then what I don't want is for you to just inundate us in a tokenistic way yeah. with loads of faces yeah. of colour because then it's it's got no it's got no authenticity, mm -hmm. it's not no. genuine and no. also it's not representative. All I want is look, make it a meritocracy. You've had an advert pro you've had a audition process. People have come in. That black guy was really good. That white girl was really good. That Indian child was really good. Whatever it Put the best people that's right. into the roles. Like that's all I want. Don't start because do, oh, you see, I, I'm, I'm in the industry, so you see adverts come out. Oh, we need, we need like a black family, or we need like a mixed race looking guy to play. It's like no, just base it on the meritocracy. Let's let's get the best yeah, people yeah. for the jobs in mm. all ways. Sincerity in that situation, you can tell from an out from the outside looking mm. in. No matter where you are, you can see whether it's sincere or not. And I, I'd be hard pushed to think of anything that gets presented to us on television, or well, maybe a small percentage of people that are there on merit, but a lot of it is insincere. Yeah. It's a representation tokenism. Yeah. The other issue that I have quite a gripe with, and I've, we've talked about this before, is people of color, so let's take last, last year, right, um, with the BLM movement. There seems to be an undercurrent within society if you're from an ethnic minority, that the only way that your voice can be heard is by screaming and shouting and going out. Remember the riots, right? Had to use violence, to go to the street. I feel personally, we've been programmed to go out and shout and scream. But hold on a minute. There's people in our 
from our backgrounds and our cultures that excel to such an enormous level. Why are we not out there, not screaming and shouting, but representing our skills mm -hmm. on a, on within uh, the economy, within entertainment, as you are, and and going just kind of pound for pound matching instead of going out and screaming and shouting about it. Let's go and work towards it. Let's go and match our fuck it, man, oppressors <laughs> to that yeah. level. Yeah, yeah? yeah exactly. to say, well, okay, I'm as good as you are. Yeah. I'm not going to take yeah, to the yeah. street and scream and shout about it. Yeah. I'm going to show you off the back of my skill set how yeah. good I am. But I think if to, just to, I agree with you, but just to kind of, I guess, have a retort to what you're saying is that we, we are doing that. But the problem is, is that, that even when I do these documentaries, I'm like, why did I know about you? I meet these people and why don't I know about you? You find these people who are matching their contemporaries, um, but they are not getting as much push to the forefront in terms of being understood or acknowledged as maybe the screamer shouter who you know you're violent. that you know you're that person though you know? yeah yeah like i know like look, you need to understand like i i i say i say to my friends all the time i understand my own journey i'm probably not going to get my my accolades and my flowers until i'm gone but i'm cool with that no 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 no, no. i'm cool no, i'm cool with that because i understand what i'm doing i understand that my position is to provide a foundation for those that come after me so for instance like say this is the like say this is the door yeah for me, it was like that for me to get through. My job really is to make sure that I've edged it a bit more so that those who come after me have a bit of an easier um, journey of getting through this door. So I know also that if I was to do some viral, can I swear? I can't swear. Of course you can. <laughs> yeah, you can. To do some viral shit yeah. online, bro, like you might not even be able to get me here today because I'm going to be so busy. Yeah. You know what I mean? But... I believe in longevity. I believe in having a moralistic compass. I believe in I believe in creating content and being a person of substance. Not saying that some of those people that do that stuff are not, because sometimes you know, I know people that, that are viral stars and they're, mm. they're of extreme substance, mm -hmm. but they're getting to the bag. And I understand it, but me as a person, I think I've got to the stage where I've understood my journey. Like I've done things in my career where if you look at it, you think to yourself, what the, f why is this guy like, or even, why has he not got a blue tick? Someone said to me, why, why, why have you got a blue tick? I was like, bro, I don't, listen, I don't know. Listen, listen, I listen. I, 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 Shazad said to me the other day, he's like, how the fuck have you got this guy? And I was like, bro, I don't know how I've got this guy. <laughs> and I was like, why has he not got a bigger following? <laughs> I, do you like, know what, Aaron, I, he's, he's absolutely right because yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I've seen your stuff and I've, I've seen the documentaries that you make and I've, I've seen the angle that you take and it's so refreshing mm -hmm. and there is an element inside of me that thinks, how is he getting away with that? Yeah. Now, how fucked up is that? Yeah. How are you getting away with having those topics and, yeah. and, and, and bringing mm -hmm. those to the forefront? I mean, there was the Stop and Search documentary yeah. that you did yeah. and there's a part in there where you're role playing, yeah. right? And <laughs> you kind of look at, I'm, I'm watching you and I'm yeah. thinking, is is he actually the policeman? Like, where is this coming from? <laughs> yeah. But that's lived experience yeah. that that you that you and, yeah. and again, you know, some of the stuff you're doing is 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 is, is amazing, and it, it shocks me. Yeah. And please don't see this as any disrespect that you don't have a bigger platform. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Honestly, because you're trailblazing. Yeah, but they tell me though. I, I go into the meetings like, Arab, we need to make sure you improve your following. We need to have you doing more of this and more of that. And sometimes some of the things that they suggest, I'm, I'm like, mm. but to be honest, I'm at a point now where. I'm more open. I've got a big meeting next week, actually, on a Thursday. I'm more open, but I'm open in a way where I, don't, I still don't want to compromise myself. So even when you said to me to come today, the reason why I came here is because I'm, I'm more open. I'm like, do you know what? I want to come to places and just show. I think, do you know what it is? I haven't shown all of me as yeah. uh, enough. Like my friends watch the documentaries and like they find it funny because they know me as a madman, like yeah, yeah. I, like an idiot. But like when I do documentaries, I'm quite serious because I, I do have a, a multifaceted personality. But I think it's time now. I'm a grown man. It's time for me to show all of me. And yeah. If that means go, going on platforms like this and just really being really honest and showing more of me and and really saying it as explicitly as it needs to be said, that's what I'm on. And I think that's what I haven't done. Like I think, and that goes back to the positioning. Like I was talking to a younger person the other day who works for BBC, and he was like, "Yeah, but you see your generation, yeah, because I'm he's 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 early twenties, I think." I'm not going to say how old I am, but I'm getting there, yeah? <laughs> and what he was saying is, like, you lot, when you lot came in, you lot were more kind of respectful in there. And, you know, you kind of had to be tentative. You had to, yeah, like, yeah. you know what I mean? Cross your I's, dot your I's, cross your T's. He's saying, my generation, we're like, he's saying to me, one of the guys I work with at BBC, but he comes in in a tracksuit and shit. And he just, he just, he bees himself, but he does his job to a, we couldn't do that. Even yeah. if I was doing mm. my, my, my job to a certain quality. Watch my first documentaries. 
I'm wearing like jackets. And, yeah, yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? More, you know what I mean? It's yeah. like because I understood that I am in a field and in a forum that is not really meant for me. That's right. Yeah. So what do I have to do? I have to still give them me, but I have to be palatable. You know what I mean? So why I say that is that I came in so early that I still understand how it used to be. We weren't, we weren't on TV. Like, to be honest, apart from Reggie, yeah, that's yeah, just, yeah. I was like, I'm the first like young black man, especially from the kind of background I'm from, I've seen to host documentaries and documentary series on national TV. But then you say, why is that not more heralded? I'll give you this as well. When I first came out, I was doing Channel 5. I should even say this. But Channel 5, for some reason, almost have a stigma. It's almost like people, because of how they first came, people don't really respect That's Channel right. 5. Yeah. So even though I've done some amazing production on Channel 5, I think I've done, like, not to be arrogant, but me and my teams have done award-winning level of, of, of investigation and production and, and TV shows. But because it was on Channel 5, it didn't get as much respect. It wasn't nominated for the awards. Fast forward now, I finally get a chance to do a documentary with BBC. <clears throat> Stop and Search, yeah? Nominated for a Broadcast Digital Award straight away. Is it any better than what I've done before? I'm not too sure. I don't think so. But it's on the BBC. Yeah. So there is snobbery even within the tv industry to, not even to do with me but snobbery within the tv industry in terms of the platform i remember i supposed it around even in some of these groups that i was in in fact i left a black a black group a black broadcasters group because i remember when i post my stuff in there it's like people wouldn't say anything they wouldn't re reply to it but then when people other people are posting it's like oh great da, 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 da. and i was like do you know what? i'm going to give it one more chance and post something that i've got coming out and if no one if, if the reaction is the same i'm going to leave the group even within that group, it's almost like, oh, Channel 5. Yeah. And then my shows are cool stuff like when teens kill, when kids kill. That people are thinking, what is he? Is he like out here like kind of glamorizing and sensationalizing? Yeah. No, I'm not. Watch my shows. I was on a journey where I'm trying to understand what has happened, but then also show you what is deep done about it. And also show you how these things could be avoided. I'm not here to focus on pain and trauma. I'm here to help parents, help people understand what's happening and also what can be done to prevent it happening again. But, you know, it's a techie industry, man. But it comes mm. back to what you said at the beginning about knowledge. Yeah. And the more knowledge <clears> and lived <throat> experience that you can express, the more easier it is for people to adapt to certain things. Mm. I mean, from, from our perspective, the reason why we, we set up Leading Minds was purely because we'd been in situations where, you know, pretty dark <clears> um, <throat> and just didn't have the support around us. Yeah, um, and it was really a case of, okay, well, look, if we can tell our story mm -hmm. and, and talk from a position of lived experience, it'll allow other people to come on and have that conversation. And then for us to be able to provide the resources that aren't available yeah. all in one place. And linking today's conversation back to that, race, racism, discrimination, societal issues, mm -hmm. all play a massive part on our youth's mental health and this is why again i'll come back and say it again it surprises me how you've got to the position that you've got to coming from where you came from mm -hmm. and the issues around mental health at that point oh, yeah, the pressures of, of, of having to live up to some a, mm -hmm. a certain standard in society to be able to have overcome them mm -hmm. do you know what i mean i mean there's kids out there right now we know there's a massive problem on the streets um you know you, you can only I mean, it, it pains me to think what goes through their heads every single day they leave their houses. Well, well you know, today I made sure I got my my phone, my keys, and my wallet. Whereas theirs is phone, maybe two phones. Yeah. Um. What a money! Have I got my Rambo? Where's my knife? At? Yeah. You know, where's, where's the where's the where's the drugs? At? I mean. <laughs> I don't. We we spoke on it on the uh, on the uh, I think it was on the first podcast. I, I don't know when. Um, like I I I tried to be a drug dealer for like f four weeks and I was a terrible <laughs> terrible terrible one. You know I wasn't no no kingpin, but like I I'm very fort like there, there's things that were that happened in my environment which no child should have to go through. But at the same time, it's a drop in the ocean compared to what would happen if I lived twenty miles deeper in into London and what these kids and 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 just like yourself and just like me and every single person in this room right now we always only scratch the surface surface when we open up to people about what is really going through our heads and what we're experiencing daily because with like 
whether the 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 fact they're they're, they're leaving the house because they want to like what's it call it wet someone up or whatever it is they want to do but it's also fear because their life could be taken that day so they're waking up every single day saying could be today yeah this is this is what i mean i mean the, the pressures on on society from people from you know it's black history month so from let's talk about black backgrounds is immense i mean imagine being 14 years old and having to worry about your life mm. i mean come on yeah well well like that's how it was even for us like when we were when we were in our area we were cool but whenever we used to leave the area we used to make sure that we were equipped appropriately and it's just a, a, a reality but um to go back to nowadays issue um not to to demonize them but i think a massive problem that you've got with the young people is that they are almost forcing this actuality of having ops you know mm. you, you see there's areas yeah. and there's a, oh, sorry ops being opposition or a, a, a area that they've got a problem with you see it with areas that never used to have such issues and they've fragmented now because it's almost like if your area doesn't have enemies your area is not cool or valid yeah. and through that um through that creation that they've done this whole ops not saying that we haven't had it before we always had um areas that didn't get yeah, along of course. It's, it's it's really it's really it's like, at a granular it's level exponential now. Yeah, now. Yeah. it's exponential now um but that that actuality of this ops is causing for more issues to arise because sometimes it's literally across the road yeah I've been to areas where they're like, yeah, that side. I remember I went to an, I think I was in Hackney and the guy was telling me, yeah, like man that live over here, can't go to the job center over there. So they've got to go all the way up this road, take a bus, come round that area, just go to the job center. I'm like, what the hell is going on? But then to get back to what you said about, oh, like where the head is, I'll be honest with you. Like a lot of the young people, it's not so much that there's not a mental, there isn't a, men a mental realization. A lot of them, when these things happen, it's very mindless. I've gone to the jails. Like I've been to, I've been to the jail. I went to the jail where the young boys were, and I said to them, "Please don't tell me their crimes, because I just want to meet people for who they are." And then, if anything, you could tell me after. Funny enough, some of the ones that I got on with the best in there were the murderers. Anyway, that's besides the point. <clears throat> I speak to these young men after now about what's happened, and like, all remorseful, and not because I'm some sort of probation officer. Like I'm not gonna go and give you a glowing review, but like oh yeah do you know what it was and then near, near enough all of them as well that had murdered did it with somebody else these kids are not murdering by themselves no mm. they're murdering it's adrenaline it's the, it's the madness oh yeah no, I'm gonna jump in as well all of them remor remorseful oh do you know I just had a mad moment at the end and, and me and my guy we just you know we saw this we saw this guy I had a problem with and then boom 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 and then now I mean hey I remember I was talking to them and I was like how long have you got left and I was putting it on them like I'm not going in there to be your friend I'm going in to put it on you too I don't want to see you back here I told her I don't want to see you back in there how long have you got left I'm putting it on them when I'm inside there oh, I've only got about two years oh, I'm waiting to be sentenced oh I've got about three years left then one boy walks and said how long have you got left and he was like oh 60 years I said stop messing about how long have you got left he's like oh no six. Like, and the rest of them were like no 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 Aaron he's got 16 years left this boy's like 17 years old what a waste He's what got waste. 16 years left in jail. I'm like, what? Yeah, yeah, I had a mad one. Me and my Cody, we both got... I'm like, this is insane. To be honest, you're going to come out and still be able to uh, to have a life. But what life? But you've lost a, a, a lot of it. You know? yeah. do, you, do you know what the irony is, right? For is, mindless decisions. Yeah, for, is, for, for moments yeah. of madness. Yeah, a moment of madness, right? But the irony is, a lot of kids from um, from ethnic backgrounds somehow some reason they all have within them this entrepreneurial spirit to go and make money yeah. all it is is they choose the wrong route if you i mean i i, I i've said this before actually I, I i originate from maidenhead down the road we have slough and in slough massive ethnic minority yeah. uh, um, uh, kind of a community there um and and, and it's, it's it's well known a lot of them get up, get, up, get up to a lot of nefarious things but if you were to take them out of that um, that area mm -hmm. and put them into an area that was slightly more affluent, mm -hmm. oh my God, they'd be the next Bill Gates, Steve Jobs mm -hmm. of this world. I've seen it. I've seen people turn street acumen into, into business acumen. It's very possible, but I think what you said is a very important point. You said that a lot of these young people from ethnic backgrounds are entrepreneurial, and that is because they want to get money because they want to it starts off as wanting to help your family or yeah. wanting to get out of the situation but somewhere down the line it turns to greed it turns to conflicts yeah. it turns to you know which is why it's important to, to 
for oh, I know it's a, it's a massive statement, but it's important for us to to see those entrepreneurial skills and try to redirect because <laughs> this is going to sound mad, but being a successful drug dealer is not easy. Yeah. It takes quite a lot of organizational skills. It takes a lot of um, logistical skills. It takes sometimes even great mathematical skills. And it also takes a great, <laughs> a great ability to be, to be uh, covert. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, you know what I mean? Like not, not to try to, gl to, to glamorize it, but I'm just saying these are all skills that can be easily transferred. Yeah. transferred. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. and I've seen it once or twice. You know what I mean? I, I know some boys that, um, you know, they've, finally got there one of my close friends got his hands free uh clean finally you know what i mean he's got a job that he works like in fact he's always worked that job even when he was doing what he was doing but he's investing money into property and you know even out of the country and doing different things i know it's not the best way to do it get your capital through through illegal ventures but my thing is i try not to judge the journey i try to judge where you are yeah, mm -hmm. yeah exactly. and if you're doing better and you haven't hurt anybody and nobody is um at a, at a loss because of your actions so be it you know just try to do better for next and try to pass that on i think yeah. something that i learned quite early in my career um through being part of a european program i was with all different countries is that they, they would always teach us to make sure we pass it on like and that's why I still do what I do. Even I got an event to do this month. Like I'm, I'm talking to you. It's always important for us to pass it on. We have to. I'm yeah, glad. I'm absolutely. glad. I'm glad you mentioned absolutely. that because I was speaking to one of my boys, and it's mad because he, so it, there, there's no white in him. You know, he, he's fully African. He's from yeah. Zimbabwe, and he 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 messaged me. Like, he messaged me all the time. He's like, bro, I'm so proud of you. Yeah. Um. And you keep doing what you're doing. He's like. He's like black. It always messages me like black excellence when I when I post yeah. anything like to do with the podcast or whatever. Yes, and I and I love that. And I want to be how you are. And and I now I feel that we do need to um pay it back, pay it forward, and and have big stepping stones for our younger black community so that once we are gone, and even when we're here, I'd like to help people while I'm here. Mm. You know. That we are helping our, our, our communities. Where he's like, no, you haven't got to do that. You haven't got to prove anything to anything. And I'm like, no, we have to. We mm. we do. But you know what? I've got to take my hat off to them. Like organically, they're doing it themselves. Mm. Like this next generation is fearless. I think maybe the proliferation of the internet and the things that you can do in terms of monetizing internet presence and popularity or whatever else it is has helped. But this younger generation, are, bro, like they 16, 17 business owners. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like even some of the rappers, I remember like, Oh, there's a rapper that I like. He's a drill rapper, actually, but he does kind of like what I would call like um, intelligent kind of like, f not friendly, but intelligent drill. His yeah. name is SL. Like the youngers will know who he is. And I remember when he first came out, I think he was like 16. And then I found out that like, his manager was like 17. And then the guy that was the A&R to get him signed was around the same age as well. 18 year old, 17 year old a and created sub-communities. Like, that's what they've done, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. And that's becoming regular. Yeah. But, I, and, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned drill because it's something I was gonna speak on earlier. Yeah. Like, I love listening to some some drill music yeah. and I think there's, there's different variations of drill music. And there's that whole narrative that's being pushed, especially by police, by that, by, by drill music influencing um, people to, to kill people. And 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 I and I, I have to agree with it in some in some way. But you could argue that about Call of Duty, you know, and 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 games, con consoles, or, or films, t t TV programs. I disagree though, and I'll explain to you why. Yeah, drill music is not causing more problems or more deaths. All drill music is actually doing is amplifying yeah. mm. um, yeah. already present problems. Hundred percent. Because now there's a there is a music form where it's almost normative for you to speak about these things. It's normative for you to amplify those problems because you can have. We've always had problems with yeah. other areas, but we just wouldn't even talk about them. I don't talk about them, man. Dear. Yeah, we wouldn't talk about them. But now it's normative for you to talk about them, address them, address their friend who's dead, who you know who got killed in that kind of way. Talking about putting him in a spliff, which basically means he's mm. dead. But it's a very disrespectful way to talk about someone who's passed away. So what's happened is, is that drill music is not causing more of the violence, but it's amplifying the problems that that that, that is happening with this violence. I, I, and that's and that's truthfully what I believe because I because these were these things were happening before drill. Well, you you're you're right. You're They're right. And I, so I I don't I don't want to say like glamorizing it, but I I just think it's 
there it's, is a, there is a part of it. I think I think it's glamorized as well, but yeah. I guess it's adding more more fuel to the fire. Exactly. You know, if if you yeah, you, you're, you're right. It, it, it's it's not helping stop stop gang violence. Put it that way. It's amplifying already pro- present problems, mm. and and that is problematic. But I don't think it's problematic enough for us to say stop the music. But because no, also, no way. Because yeah. because what, what what is it doing? It, it once once like you like I like Shazad, we have that light bulb revelation moment. What they're doing from a financial standpoint will be able to take them out of their environment, and they yeah. do good. Look at Gets. Yeah, that's you know? my that's my that's my that's my good friend. You know, look yeah. at uh, um look look at Gets and yeah. what what he's done, and like so the, 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 the movement is what got me into grime. Yeah. You know, Bro, Getz, um, is my, that's my, that's one of my closest friends in <clears> the industry. Like we're very close. Like, but. There's something I wanted to say as well. Oh, gosh, there's something I wanted to say off the back of what you just said. Um, yeah, it is helping with them with getting opportunities. But um, yes, that's what I wanted to say. I think the bigger problem here is that we're finding scapegoats for the issue. We need to get to the root that's mm. right, of the issue. That's exa- I was and, just going to say the same thing. And exactly. one, one thing that I, I suggest from my professional perspective as someone who's worked with young people for over over 10 years is we need to have more aftercare yeah right so we've got young people who are experiencing their friend or someone that they know being killed or sometimes even seeing the person be killed in a certain way and then they're just expected to go back out into the world and just be normal do you not think every person who's witnessed such a thing needs to have some sort of aftercare they need to have some sort of therapeutic aftercare because otherwise what happens is is that they're dealing with these internalized emotions that they don't understand and i always tell people hurt people hurt people Mm. yeah absolutely it's as simple as that so unless we get to the root of the problem and try to really provide some aftercare for these young people and these people in these environments that are experiencing such trauma you're just going to see a continual exponential this is this is the problem this is the societal problem and this Mm. is the reason why we've set up what we have the resources aren't available it's almost as if, right, you're involved in that. Okay, fine, you've seen this, but we actually don't care because you shouldn't have got involved in it yeah. in the first place. Mm-hmm. So you're you're kind of, you're, you're painted with that brush, but actually the support that they need, exactly, you nailed it. Mm-hmm. Going through that trauma and not having the support, where is that going to lead you? I love that. Hurt people, hurt people. Mm-hmm. It's absolutely 100% true. But the government is failing everyone right now when it comes to mental health issues in the cabinet reshuffle back in on september the 15th they filled every position they didn't fill the position of mental health our minister yeah what does that tell you they don't take it seriously that's what it shows you they don't they don't value it they don't take it seriously and and they they could deal with some of it inside their cabinet as well to be honest they could deal with some it's 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 just it's just not there the support's not there yeah. um aaron listen it's we could sit here and i i, I know <laughs> i'm thinking like, <laughs> talk like and bro, talk man, and it's, talk. Been, it's been it's we been amazing are out of time man thank you so much for coming on today no, honestly. honestly you you're an inspiration to a generation yeah. you know you're very very talented and, and and people need to see the stuff that you've got and your i mean your vocabulary today has just been <laughs> amazing man amazing <laughs> but um also as well so Spending Black the Currency Community. Yeah. That's out on BBC iPlayer. Yes. Everyone can go watch that right now. Yeah. Um thank you so much, thank man. Thank you for having me, man. It's and and I just I just wanna I want Aaron to be the beacon for everyone with a with a larger platform out there, you know. Aaron has come here and spent time today. A lot of I'm gonna call them influencers or, or influential people are talking about mental health with hidden agendas behind it you know aaron's mm-hmm. come here giving up his time today and and giving us incredibly uh an incredible amount of value and uh we, we really appreciate that man yeah, this has been episode 12 of the leading minds podcast thank you for listening <laughs>